Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Healthcare Executive Webinar Series, Population Health Management, Building a Culture of Wellness and Prevention. My name is Greg Wallstrom. I will be your guide for today's discussion. We would like to especially thank Dr. Mandeep Mangat, one of our panelists today, for joining forces with the Healthcare Executive to bring this population health program to our healthcare executives globally. As we conclude today's webinar, you'll be directed to a short survey which we hope you will take the time to fill out. If any IT problems arise, please visit support.anymeeting.com for further assistance. As we begin the presentation, can you please mute your telephone lines until the question and answer portion of the event? On the left-hand side of the webinar platform screen is a text box to write a question to the presenters. If you have a general question, please insert your question into the text box. If you have a specific question for one of the presenters, please insert his or her name next to your question. Just as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. We are truly honored to have so many of you from different parts of the world participating in today's discussion. As we move on to the next page, we will talk about today's program description. Population health is a transformative factor in reducing chronic illness and key components of healthcare reform. As it is dedicated to creating a fundamentally different culture and perspective focused on wellness and prevention. This program will provide new insights about topics related to chronic illness management, wellness and prevention, health promotion, and access to care. It will also provide an update on current and proposed models of population health management. Today, we will be covering providing a current summary of healthcare challenges, the role of population health management in rewarding value over volume, conducting community health needs assessments to address priority health needs, assessing the role of population health programs in reducing length of stay, readmission, and costs from hospital to home, evaluating the role of shared decision-making and patient experience in managing population health, providing an understanding of the policies related to healthcare reform, considering current and proposed models of care to improve quality, standardization, and access, reducing costs, and promoting accountability of care, providing specific examples of successful population health program, discussing the application of evidence-based medicine to improve healthcare, and developing meaningful outcome measures and collecting related data, as well as supporting improvement in clinical outcomes through interoperable health information technology, and which models of healthcare have demonstrated most potential in improving quality and reducing cost of care in specific healthcare settings, as well as discussing your organization use and advanced analytics to drive population health initiatives. Um, now I'd like to introduce today our subject matter expert. Um, today's moderator, Greg Wallstrom. Greg Wallstrom is a result-oriented senior healthcare executive with more than 15 years of broad experience in business, healthcare, and human services, and extensive operational and administrative expertise. He is currently the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Healthcare Executive, leading organizational performance assessment in multiple program areas, followed up with customized C-suite healthcare training that speaks to identified needs. Greg has delivered focused programming around key elements to achieve success based upon best practices and emerging best practices that show promise of improving healthcare organizations nationally and internationally. He has led webinars and face-to-face -face webinars for thousands of healthcare administrators and executives through the American College of Healthcare Executives. Prior to the healthcare executive, Greg worked as an assistant administrator director of social services, and as a behavioral health case manager. Greg received a master's degree in business administration and healthcare management and a bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Phoenix. He has also completed studies abroad at Shanghai University and Shanghai, China, and he is also a member of the American College of Healthcare Executives. Greg is also the current immediate past chairman of the Healthcare Executive Education Committee for the Central Illinois Chapter of ACHC. Our next presenter, Dr. Mandeep Manget, MD, MPH, Senior Administrator, Population Health Management and Clinical Integration, Beta Home Healthcare. Mandeep K. Magnet, MD, MP, MPH, is a Senior Administrator of Population Health Management at Beta Home Health Practice. She directs the ongoing development, implementation, and coordination of population population health initiatives aimed at enhancing quality of patient care and clinical outcomes at a system level. Prior to joining this position in 2014, she worked as a physician 
public health professional and director of general medicine department and acute care settings. She has over 14 years of extensive healthcare experience in hospital medicine, home health, clinical operations, population health, and operational efficiencies improvement in both national and international settings. Her interests include outcomes management, results-driven continuous improvement, and multi-level determinants of population health. She received her medical degree, MD, from St. Petersburg Medical Academy, master's degree in public health, MPH degree with a focus in health administration from Westchester University, and a Lean Six Sigma Healthcare Process Improvement Master's Certification, LSS, from Villanova University. Our next presenter, Dr. Leslie Matthew, MD, MS, EMBA, FACHE, Chair, Healthcare Management Program, Franklin University. Dr. Matthew has 35 years experience in the healthcare industry, having worked internationally over the years after completing his MD in 1979. He specialized in the medical diagnostic area and has pioneered and chaired departments of pathology and laboratory medicine in East always involved with teaching and patient services in the different positions he's held at the academic medical centers over the past three decades. He has been awarded numerous teaching excellent awards in recent years, and besides earning a master's in biotechnology enterprise from John Hopkins University, he has also had the privilege of completing the executive MBA program from the Fisher College of Business while working as an administrative director of operations. At the Ohio State University Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio, Dr. Matthews has taught both undergraduate and graduate level in healthcare and business in both non nonprofit and for profit institutions. Most recently, he's worked as a dean of education for higher education groups that had 52 schools with mainly allied health programs from the United States. Currently, the program chair for allied health healthcare management and healthcare management programs at Franklin University College of Healthcare and Public Administration in Columbus, Ohio. He has been an active member of ACAG and has earned the distinction of being a fellow of the college. And our final presenter this afternoon, Sean Zirke, MPH, Executive Director, ICPHA, Iowa County's Public Health Association. Sean Zirke is a public health policy and administrative healthcare executive with more than 10 years of experience blending organizational management, understanding of healthcare practice and advocacy for Iowa's aging and disability community. Current projects and volunteer activities include work with policy related to public health, rural health, population health management, state level legislative advocacy for aging and disability communities, and develop toolkit to increase collaboration between county public health and accountable care organizations, ACOs. Developed and delivered 67 customers crosswalk toolkits for Iowa's County Public Health Departments to collaborate with their regional Medicare ACO to achieve quality measures and earn shared saving incentives. Sean received a 2014 Health Science Research Web Poster Competition T4 Translation Research Award for presenting research on the highest caliber during 2014, High Health Science Research Week Post Session, Reducing Unplanned 30-Day Hospital Readmission Among Patients with pneumonia and congestive heart failure over the age of 65. She received her master's in public health policy from the University of Iowa College of Public Health and is currently completing her master's in business administration and social, social entrepreneurship. She is currently the executive director for Iowa County's Public Health Association re representing local health administ administrators from 101 public health departments across the state of Iowa. Now we'd like to interject a, a quick poll question, and that is, how many in the audience are international attendees versus domestic? I saw the result is 98% domestic, and I guess about 2% is international. So I just closed the polling. Okay. So we can see that primarily most of our attendees are joining us from here in the States. I'm going to go ahead and pass the floor over to Dr. Mandeep Mangat. Dr. Mandeep, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Greg, and thank you for the introduction. Welcome to all of you who are reading or listening to this webinar. I have been asked to discuss some of the key healthcare challenges and the role of population health management in improving the health outcomes. First of all, the United States spends roughly twice as much on healthcare as other advanced countries do, yet the outcomes are inferior in many respects. There's a shifting demographics of patients 
and the workforce. There's also drive towards cost efficiency, transition to value-based reimbursement, and increasing demand for cost and quality data transparency. There's also increased focus on physician leadership, alignment, and engagement, and reducing variations in care. There's need for clinical integration and peer coordination, and a growing demand for patient and family engagement. Now, the biggest barriers to population health management are the fragmentation, non-standardized care delivery, poor communication between inpatient and outpatient providers, misaligned financial incentives, and lack of managed care knowledge, and also insufficient use of health information technology. Healthcare reform has not solved the major problems of our system with respect to quality, access, and cost. To do that, we will need to achieve the tripling and find a way to manage population health efficiently. Population health management requires an organized system of care. It has been defined as an approach which focuses on the health outcomes of individuals in a group and the distribution of outcomes in that group. Most people don't think about diseases or worry if they have one. Most are not under treatment or see their PCP regularly. But for all people, the environment in which they live, their race, culture, language skills, lifestyles, and behavior are important determinants of their individual health. These non-medical determinants of health, which have far greater impact than medical care, are not being addressed properly. The fee-for-service payment system that rewards providers for volume of services has been implicated in the high cost of health care in the United States. Fee-for-service incentivizes physicians to perform more services rather than help patients get well or prevent them from getting sick. Physicians usually have no financial incentive to communicate with patients online or care for them at home. Over the past 20 years or so, approaches such as paper performance and disease management have had a very limited effect on quality improvement. More promising models, including patient-centered medical home and the accountable care organizations have emerged in past few years. The industry at this point is in midst of a rapidly accelerating shift from fee-for-service to various forms of pay-for-value, and signs are evident around us. Health insurer Aetna is paying incentives to practices that have achieved recognition as patient-centered medical homes and is working with provider groups and health systems to create accountable care organizations. One of the nation's largest insurers, WellPoint, has tied a third of its commercial reimbursement to pay for quality programs. Medicare's share saving programs are rewarding ACOs that create savings and meet quality goals. As we transition to new care delivery models, instead of basing our decisions on how the clinicians and organizations can produce costly billable services, we need to maintain or improve patients' health and deliver good outcomes. Whether an organization is identifying the population and cure gaps, stratifying risk, engaging the patients with interventions, managing care, or measuring outcomes, an integrated technology foundation is required decrease costs and improve clinical quality. Achieving results involves conducting gap analysis of current technologies, identifying vendors with necessary solutions to fill those gaps, and implementing the solutions successfully. Now, there are automation opportunities in each of the care team process steps listed on the slide. For instance, in terms of managing care and targeting the right patients, we can conduct assessments during office visits or over the phone using paper or other tools that may or may not be integrated into EMR. Or we can send all patients online health risk assessment tools, and the results can be used for individual and population health management activities. Patients who are well today may be sick tomorrow. The front end of infrastructure for population health management is predictive modeling, which forecasts which patients are likely to get sick or sicker in the near term. It depends on computer algorithms that can recognize patterns in data. Very few organizations do predictive modeling at this point because most don't have enterprise data warehouses or registries required for this approach. But that is expected to change under new payment models that put them at financial risk. The term community health needs assessment refers to the process of community engagement, collection, 
analysis, interpretation of data on health outcomes and health determinants, identification of health disparities, and identification of resources that can be used to address priority needs. The ACA requires nonprofit hospitals and health systems to conduct assessments every three years and then develop community health improvement plans. Many public health departments already perform needs assessments as part of their accreditation process. All of this sows the seeds for greater cooperation among hospitals, public health departments, and other community organizations. I think that Affordable Care Act is serving as a catalyst to bring together the two sectors because the focus of ACA is so much on improving population health. We have gone from the time when most diseases were acute to now when most are chronic. But physicians don't have the tools to go beyond the clinic walls. The ultimate goal is that the hospital's role will be reduced because people will be cared for more on the outside. It's less expensive and easier for two or more hospitals to create a needs assessment together, likely in concert with local public health departments. At first, that typically would involve tackling some of the more easily identified community health problems, such as smoking or obesity or prevention of prescription opioid use. I think through this process, the organizations learn how efficient it is to have all the parties at the table. When the various entities have same prioritized issues, they may use the same qualitative and quantitative data. A common set of health status metrics can facilitate comparisons across populations, promote collaboration between organizations conducting assessments. It can also assist in establishing a shared understanding of the factors that influence health. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Community Health Assessment Report on this slide is meant to be a time-saving resource for identifying and analyzing data for community health needs. This report provides a reference list of most frequently recommended health outcomes and determinants, and where possible, this report links each health outcome and determinant to valid indicators available at the Metropolitan Statistical Area County or sub-county level. So what you see on this slide are some useful resources for community health assessment, including CHNA tools, U.S. Census Bureau website, the CDC Wonder, and county health rankings. The issue of unnecessary hospital readmissions is now front and center in the national conversation about quality of health care. Thanks to Medicare's readmission reduction program, hospitals are working hard to bring their readmission rates down. Readmission affects nearly a fifth of Medicare patients discharged from the hospital. CMS will find hospitals with high readmission rates and an estimated total of $428 million in fiscal year 2015. The increase in overall penalty amount and number of hospitals was partly driven by the addition of additional conditions total hip, total knee replacement, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease to the program, in addition to heart attack, heart failure, and pneumonia 30-day readmission rate. In fiscal year 2017, CMS will add coronary artery bypass grafting cabbage readmissions to the program. It's probably a good idea for hospital executives to start focusing on their performance on this measure right away, as it is most likely being counted towards fiscal year 2017 payments and will mean higher penalties for many when it's all said and done. The immediate cause of readmission is usually a rapid worsening in patients' condition, but it can be attributed to systemic failures of a fragmented healthcare system that too often leaves discharged patients confused about how to care for themselves at home and unable to follow instructions and get the necessary follow-up care. A list of innovations to improve care transitions out of hospitals are now sweeping through the hospital sector. There are several new government incentives and a rising awareness of the need to improve patient safety, which are forcing hospitals to place an increased emphasis on discharge planning and post-acute care. Like I mentioned before, beginning in fiscal year 2015, CMS will scrutinize readmissions for acute exacerbation of COPD, elective total hip and total knee arthroplasty. Through the government-sponsored partnerships for patients, CMS is paying community-based organizations a set amount 
for discharge for managing Medicare beneficiaries at high risk for readmission. Under CMS bundling demonstrations, which started in April 2013, providers may choose among the four options which are listed on the slide, Model 1 to 4. Medicare Shared Savings Program for Accountable Care Organizations, which began in 2012, also has a strong incentive to cut readmissions in order to generate shared savings. Hospitals should consider the use of innovative technologies and patient portals to improve communication between patients and clinicians to improve the quality of care and reduce readmissions of patients with chronic diseases. Academic ex experts have identified several other approaches that can reduce readmissions. Institute for Healthcare Improvement's IHI model advises focusing on the patient's journey over time across settings and enhanced assessment of post-discharge needs. Hormone care transitions interventions model emphasizes the use of transition codes to visit the patient in the hospital and at home and make follow-up phone calls to help patients with self-management skills. The Naylor transitional care model involves care coordination by transitional care nurse with advanced practice training to visit the patient daily during his or her hospital stay, visit the patient at home during the first 24 hours after discharge, and then weekly during the first month. There are other resources that your organization can leverage from, including the BOOS program of Society of Hospital Medicine. In terms of predictive analytics, a number of vendors offer applications designed to predict which patients are likely to be readmitted to the hospital. Patients and clinicians have different expertise when it comes to making consequential clinical decisions. While clinicians know information about disease, tests, and treatments, patients know information about their body, their situations, and their goals for life. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality recommends the SHARE approach, which is basically a five-step process for SHARE decision-making, and it includes exploring and comparing the benefits, harms, and risks for each option through meaningful dialogue about what matters most to the patient. Decision aids such as educational literature, videos, or web-based tools are designed to help patients prepare for these conversations. A comprehensive review by Cochrane Collaboration found that patients viewing decision aids also choose to pursue less invasive surgery more often, a finding that has caught attention of those hoping to reduce overuse and misuse of resources. Your organization can also utilize Mayo Clinic, Shared Decision Making National Resource Center, Decision Aid. Most of Mayo's decision aids are related to chronic disease care and are designed to be used as conversational props during the office visit. For example, the diabetes medication choice decision aid that you see on the slide help patients and their providers choose among six medications commonly used to treat. First, the organization will build care teams that enable clinicians to operate at the top of their licenses. For example, many high-performing groups train medical assistants to act as health coaches for patients with chronic diseases. The organizations will apply analytic and automation applications to scale population health management to the entire population. For example, Previa Health, a 180 doctor multi-speciality group in Wisconsin, uses a program linked to its registry, which triggers automated messaging to the patients with care gaps in areas of diabetes and hypertension. The patients who were contacted through this technology made appointments at twice the rate of non-contacted patients. Some organizations will adopt a lean approach to improve their work processes. For example, care teams trained in lean principles can map out the workflow of a patient with it, identify wait times, do a root cause analysis, develop countermeasures, and reassess with data. The current trend of telehealth and remote patient monitoring will continue to grow. Patients will use mobile apps to communicate with providers and keep them informed about their health and to improve health behavior. In the end, the successful organizations will be the ones with best data and ability to use that data to drive better outcomes. To wrap up my presentation, I would like to take an opportunity to introduce a poll question. Do you think your organization has grasped the basics of population health? So we see that majority of participants think that their organization has grasped the basics of population health marginally. And it's not surprising uh, to see that result. 
So you're going to go ahead and close the poll. Okay. And then I just wanted to go ahead and ask a couple quick questions related to your presentation. So when implementing population health, health initiatives, healthcare leaders need to consider where resources should be allocated. What would you consider to be the most essential areas to consider within the spectrum of population health? So with the new healthcare delivery models, there are new demands on care systems that will require leaders to prioritize their expertise and develop diverse collaborations and co-leadership between other organizations and within their own organizations. I think a strong institutional culture and supportive infrastructure are essential to the success of population health management. Organizations would need three foundational components to integrate population health management into their organizational structure, including a capable and qualified workforce which is trained in community and population health principles, and signs of change management, keeping in mind that in population health world, end users include providers and consumers, patients and members. The organizations would also need a strong health information technology platform and a translatable data to track health trends for targeting at-risk populations. And finally, they would need organizational capacity, which would include strong backing from senior hospital leadership, clinician engagement, formalized community partnerships, and other aligned resources. Thanks for sharing. Um, one last question before Dr. Matthew presents. Um, you did a wonderful job explaining the community health needs assessment. Um, could you share with the audience this idea? Um, as healthcare leaders, we often refer to the community health needs assessment to identify and understand the leading health problems. How would you use this data to create programs to improve these health concerns? So the major goal of community health needs assessment is to use the data collected through the process to create a climate for change that leads to improvement in the health of community. The process allows the communities and, and the hospital organizations to understand what the data says about the health status of their community. The process also gives um, communities and other organizations the opportunity to discover what their residents would like to see change, which groups, organizations, or individuals are already trying to address key health issues and what barriers hinder the community's ability to achieve optimal health. Now, by providing all this data, which documents the community needs, community health needs assessment kind of allows us to build or enhance partnerships and coalitions. Community-wide involvement has especially been important over the past few years as the communities began to focus more on social determinants of health and on creation of an environment where people can be healthy. Examples of the programs that have focused on creating healthy environments include eliminating food deserts and providing more opportunities for appropriate physical activity by adding walking trails and reaching joint use agreements. These type of changes don't focus on individuals with a specific health problem, rather they target the health of overall community and that is population health. Great. Um, thanks for sharing those key insights. Um, now I'd like to introduce our next panelist, Dr. Leslie Matthew. Uh, good afternoon, Leslie. Good afternoon, Greg, and everyone. We've uh, had enjoyed a, a good presentation from Dr. Mandeep and telling us more about the issues and understanding population uh, health management as well as some of the initiatives there. I'm going to step a, back a little bit and look at a bigger picture uh, before we go on to our next uh, presenter. So um, I want to start with a poll rather than end with one, just to get a little sense of how many of you in the audience are actually working in population health management at this time. So I'm going to pull up the poll and uh, give you 20, 30 seconds to answer that. Uh, well, thank you for voting. I think most of us have voted. It almost looks like a tie break, right? 50% each, but it is, uh, yes, uh, working in population health management is 46%. And no was 52%. So I guess very slight majority there for those who are not working in population health management. And I just asked that question so that I don't get too basic in uh, what I'm going to share with you in the bigger picture behind population health management. Now, to, to just go back and think of the policies related to healthcare reform, which is very basic, here's a, a cycle of events, sometimes a vicious cycle of events, which uh, most of us are very familiar with, where we have a consumer who cannot afford the doctor and delays care and as a result uh, compounds, uh, progresses with disease and finally goes to the ER uh, 
when the limits are reached and then of course the consumer cannot pay and uh, the providers shift the cost to the insurers, the insurers shift the cost to the consumer and then you find finally the consumer drops the policy due to the high price and is now uninsured. Now all of us know that in healthcare reform the whole idea was increasing access as one of the legs of the stool was increasing access and lowering cost of course but as it pans out in the last few years we can easily see that the costs have not been contained as was originally thought of. So I fear, and we can already see that, uh, this cycle is actually repeating itself. Uh, we thought it as a thing of the past where we would not get this cycle repeating itself, but as I can show you in a few slides later, there are reasons for people to start uh, dropping out of some of these uh, newer uh, possibilities that they have through the healthcare reform, the insurance exchanges, employers passing on more of the burden back to the employee and so on and so forth. So we can see clearly that, um, you know, this cycle is still kind of operational, which is one of the, uh, you know, the, the sad parts of uh, reform not having really uh, taken us all the way to the goalpost, as it were. So uh, we're short of reaching that goal, of course, all of us know that. And I'll move to the next slide to give you something that's very basic again. And I think all of us realize that, as Dr. Mandeep also referred to that, the burden of chronic disease is a really huge problem that is, unfortunately, we have allowed that to grow and become a major issue for us. And I just wanted to give some stats here to make us even more aware that chronic disease is responsible for more than half of all deaths in the world and is projected to account for two-thirds of all deaths globally in the next 25 years. This progression of chronic disease is occurring despite the fact that these diseases are largely preventable. While the chronic disease epidemic was initially concentrated in developed countries. Globalization has caused the increase in chronic disease to be even greater in emerging economies. Now, countries that we refer to as BRIC, uh, Brazil, China, Russia, and India, uh, BRIC countries or emerging economies, currently lose more than 20 million productive life years annually to chronic disease. And that number is expected to grow 65% by 2030. This poses significant threats to the vitality of a highly interdependent global ecosystem, which in turn can threaten the sustainability of already burdened social security systems in industrialized countries, society. Well, uh, I've also put on the side a couple, uh, the little graph there that you can see the yellow growing is the chronic disease. And I've given four um, reasons why organizations would have a clear interest in preventing chronic disease for these four reasons. And I'll just elaborate a little bit on that as we go forward. Uh, in the U.S. alone, people with chronic disease account for more than 75% of the nation's $2 trillion medical spend. Whether healthcare is financed by employers, individuals, or social programs, the impact of chronic disease is placing an increasing burden on health systems, taxes, and costs of coverage, which increasingly burden organizations and their employees. The second point there is even more significant, that the productivity losses associated with workers with chronic disease are as much as 400% more than the cost of treating chronic disease. Losses in productivity include disability, unplanned absences, reduced workplace effectiveness, increased accidents, and negative impacts on work quality or customer service. The most costly conditions and health risk factors related to productivity are different from those when considering only the cost of treating the disease. Depression, fatigue, and sleeping problems, conditions or risks that are often comorbid with chronic diseases, they have the largest impact on productivity. As with healthcare costs, more risk factors multiply the losses in productivity. The third, fourth, third point I have there is that the workplace wellness efforts can positively impact human capital investment. And a quick stat here is that organizations invest an average of 290 US dollars in labor costs to generate $1,000 in revenue. By helping employees work longer and have more productive lives, organizations can protect this asset in the face of growing labor shortages globally. An organization that shows that it values its workers is more likely to attract, retain, and motivate employees. Leading organizations have utilized prevention and wellness programs to demonstrate the value they place on their workers. And lastly, we find that sustainability is threatened by the epidemic of chronic disease. The epidemic is really a product of both environment and behavior, a social phenomenon that is as equally prevalent and preventable as is issues such as global warming, infectious diseases, poverty, terrorism, and 
sanitary water and basic infrastructure. In fact, many of those issues are intertwined with the issue of chronic disease. As the economic burden of chronic disease grows, it could crowd out monies needed to improve those other critical issues and as well as to meet other basic needs such as education and infrastructure in both industrialized and emerging economies. So these four critical issues, healthcare costs, the productivity costs, the human capital investment and sustainability can drive the focus on wellness in an organization. And this really needs to uh, you know, show up and be on the radar all the time. So in conclusion on this slide, we really have to move from illness to wellness is well recognized now. Businesses will have to invest in wellness. There is really no choice. And as somebody said, it's not philanthropy, it's enlightened self-interest. So the burden of chronic disease is what I wanted to impress upon us. is really the biggest burden that is holding us back and not an easy path out of it um, for a generation at least. So let's go on to the next slide, which really is um, just trying to give you a, a little background on how we've arrived at these various models. Uh, the, if you look at our globe, there are about 200 countries on our planet, and each country devises its own set of arrangements for meeting the triple aim that Dr. Mandi talked about. But we don't have to study 200 different systems to get a picture of how other countries manage healthcare. For all the local variations, the healthcare systems tend to follow general patterns, and I'm giving you four basic models. Uh, you know, it's academic, but I think it's really the, the summarizing how the world today functions, and of course, you'll see where the U.S. fits in. The first model that you have on your left on the screen is the beverage model, named after a daring social reformer in Britain who designed the National Health Service in, uh, in the UK. Uh, many, but not all, hospitals uh, and clinics are owned by the government there. In this system, healthcare is provided and financed by the government through tax payments just like the police force or the public library. So um, some doctors are government employees, but there are also private doctors who collect their fees from the government. In Britain, you never get a doctor's bill. Many of us would like to be in the UK. <laughs> uh, these systems tend to have low cost per capita because the government, as the sole payer, controls what doctors can do and what they can charge. Now, countries using the beverage plan or variations on it include its birthplace, Great Britain, Spain, most of Scandinavia, as you can see, that, see there, and New Zealand. One country that I did not put up there was Hong Kong, small country, but still has its own beverage-style healthcare because the population simply refused to give it up when the Chinese took over that former British colony in 1997. And the last one on that model, Cuba, represents the extreme application of the beverage approach. It is probably the world's purest example of total government control. Moving on to the next model, the Bismarck model. Uh, many of us may know that it's named for the Prussian Chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, who invented the welfare system as part of the unification of Germany in the 19th century. Despite its European heritage, this system of providing healthcare would look fairly familiar to Americans. It uses an insurance system. The insurers are called sickness funds, usually financed jointly by employers and employees through payroll deduction. Unlike the U.S. insurance industry, though, the Bismarck type health insurance plans have to cover everybody and they don't make a profit. Doctors and hospitals tend to be private in Bismarck countries. Japan has more private hospitals than the U.S. Now, although this is a multi-payer model, Germany has about 240 different funds. Tight regulation gives government much of the cost control clout that the single-payer beverage model provides. And this Bismarck model is found, as we can see on the map, in Germany, France, Belgium, Netherlands, Switzerland, and to a degree, uh, Latin America as well. We move on to the next model, which is the national health insurance model. And this system really has elements of both the beverage and the Bismarck. It uses private sector providers, but payment comes from a government-run insurance program that every citizen pays into. Since there's no need for marketing, no financial motive to deny claims, and no profit, these universal insurance programs tend to be cheaper and much simpler administratively than American-style for-profit insurance. The single payer tends to have considerable market power to negotiate for lower prices. Canada's system, for example, has negotiated such low prices from pharmaceutical companies that Americans have spurned their own drug stores in many cases to buy pills north of the border. National health insurance plans also control costs by limiting the medical services they will pay for or by making patients wait to be treated, uh, as many of you know in Canada, 
there are long waiting lists for a surgery, for example. But that's how they control it. Now, the classic uh, national health insurance model is found mainly in Canada, but some newly industrialized countries like Taiwan and South Korea have also adopted this model. And lastly, I'll come to the out-of-pocket model. That, uh, and I must say that uh, you know only the developed industrialized countries, perhaps about 40 of the world's 200 plus countries, have established healthcare systems. Most of the nations of the planet are too poor and too disorganized to provide any kind of mass medical care. The basic rule in such countries, unfortunately, is that the rich get medical care, the poor stay sick or die. In rural regions of Africa, India, China, and South America, hundreds of millions of people go their whole life without ever seeing a doctor. They may have access, though, to a village healer using homebrewed remedies that may or may not be effective against disease. In the poor world, patients can sometimes scratch together enough money to pay a doctor bill. Otherwise, they pay in potatoes or goat's milk or child care or whatever else they may have to give. A kind of barter system. And if they have nothing, they don't get medical care. Now, I said all of this to say that these four models should be fairly easy for us to understand in North America because we have elements of all of them in our fragmented national healthcare paradigm. When it comes to treating veterans, we are Britain or Cuba. For Americans over the age of 65 on Medicare, we are like Canada. For working Americans who get insurance on the job, we are Germany. And for the 15% of the population who have no health insurance, the United States is Cambodia or Burkina Faso or rural India or name any of those countries that do not have a model like uh, we do. Uh, so with, uh, their only access to a doctor is available if you can pay the bill out of pocket at the time of treatment or if you're sick enough to be admitted to the emergency ward of the public uh, hospital. The United States is unlike every other country in the world because it maintains so many separate systems for separate classes of people. All the other countries have settled on one model for everybody. And this is obviously much simpler than the U.S. system, and it's fairer and cheaper too. So I took a little time to kind of explain these uh, two slides to you, and we'll move on to the next one, which is really talking more again about the basic, um, one of the that was mentioned by Dr. Mandeep was the uh, accountable care organization. And if you look at the, uh, the, the accountable care uh, organization, basically the whole structure is divided in two parts. If you ignore the complexities of the federal definition, the concept behind the ACO has been practiced actually for many years by integrated delivery networks such as Intermountain Healthcare and Kaiser Permanente. So accountable care really boils down to a very simple combination of these two things. One, managing the fixed price contracts for the treatment and management of individual patient health in contrast to fee-for-service time and materials contracts. And the second part uh, is the applying the patient-specific concept of balancing cost of care with quality of care to large populations of patients. So this Venn diagram that is here, uh, really, we're going to focus in the next slide on just the outer circle, which is really what population health management is about, and that is optimizing the health of large populations. And uh, the next slide is going to be a bit of a busy slide, and I'm not going to go through every one of them in detail, but basically uh, it shows us in order to get that optimization of the data that's required for effective population health management, there are about 12 criteria that have been listed as required in an organization uh, in order to be able to achieve the goals uh, that population health management has. Now, uh, many organizations are only at the starting point for this, some a little along, but very few have reached uh, or, and been able to achieve all of those criteria. So I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, the future of uh, population health management really depends on going forward along these criteria, and uh, you can see them uh, stretched out over a five-year period, and the first six of them uh, are those that are, we would call more foundational, and it's very important that we start with them and slowly develop the others as the foundation gets built. For example, the first one I talk about, precise patient registries. Building accurate population registries, we all know, is the foundation of effective population health management. Precise registries are the gatekeepers to accuracy. Without precise definition of the population of concern, first, everything else in the strategy suffers. Traditionally, population cohorts have been defined using billing data, specifically ICD-9 codes. However, relying solely on the billing data to define the patients in these cohorts means organizations will likely miss 
30 to 40 percent of the patients that should be included. In a value-based fixed-price contracting model, that level of inaccuracy will be financially devastating to the ACO. And so, the definition of population must be clinically informed. Billing codes represent a first step, but registries must take into account data such as lab results, functional status measurements, diagnostic imaging results, medications, claims data, procedure codes, clinical observations such as vital signs, etc. Now, all of this data extracted and filtered from different data sources in the organization's ecosystem and bound together in an enterprise data warehouse. That's what would be required to build an accurate profile of a disease or patient state. So that'll be just the first one. And as I said, I'm not going to get into uh, too many of them. Uh, but this gives you an idea of uh, what, what we face. All these things need to be uh, done in order to get population health management achieving its goals. I'll just move on as you have obviously looked at them and I can read them out, of course. The precise provider attribution is one thing that is important. Precise numerators clinical costs and metrics, then you have the um, clinical practice guidelines required, and risk management outreach. And if I go to the next slide, you'll find that I've uh, put on something which kind of indicates something like the 80-20 rule. That is, you'll find that in the, go back to that, yeah, the, you'll find that the first six criteria really is where we are going to spend 80% of our resources in the first two to three years. And then it would normally go, uh, you know, uh, less, uh, cost involvement there, whereas we'll be spending more and allocating more resources for the criteria 6 to 12 uh, over this five-year timeline that's been suggested. So I'll uh, leave uh, that thought with you, and I'm sure there's a lot more exploring that you can do. Uh, in fact, uh, there is a white paper that I may refer to by uh, Mr. Dale Sanders, who's the Senior Vice President of Health Catalyst, which really enumerates this in great detail, and I think it's a valuable resource uh, to refer to. Let me move on to the next slide, and this is just to tell you that there have been many uh, proposals, many plans that have been put forward uh, in order to um, remedy some of the ills or the problems we face with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, there have been private sector initiatives and public sector initiatives. Some of us are very familiar with value-based purchasing from the CMS or the Premier Hospital Quality Incentive Demonstration. I think Dr. Mandeep referred to that. Uh, another CMS demonstration was physician group practice demonstration, but I'm just going to focus on one of them uh, on this slide here, and that's the universal exchange plan uh, produced or uh, put forward by the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. And uh, we all know this, that uh, the ACA will especially drive up the cost of private health insurance that individuals purchase directly. The law will dramatically expand Medicaid, a program, to the poorest health outcomes of any health insurance system in the industrialized world. And the ACA, despite spending over $2 trillion over the next decade, will leave 23 million lawful U.S. residents without health insurance, according to estimates from the Congressional Budget Office. So this goes back to that initial circle that I showed you, where in spite of all of this, it looks like we're going to have a good number, according to this estimate by CDO, 23 million U.S. residents without health insurance at the end of all the efforts of ACA over 10 years. So many, as you know, are proponents and opponents of this uh, current system that we have uh, been evolving through. And there have been a lot of lobbies for uh, repealing the law and replacing it. This particular one really is more of a combination of a repeal and replace, the one put forward by the Manhattan uh, Institute for Policy Research, uh, because their concern is that we do not want to disrupt uh, the, the healthcare system while there's a repeal in order to put the U.S. on another path. So they have put this forward uh, with this consideration in mind and dubbed it the Universal Exchange Plan, which uh, seeks substanti to substantially repair both sets of the health policy problems, those caused by the ACA and those that predate it, which are still difficult ones, uh, challenging ones. So that's basically where uh, most of you can see what's up on the slide there. And you can find that uh, it repeals the ACA individual employer mandate and all tax hikes except the Cadillac tax, which of course is again a disputed tax which is to be implemented from 2018 onwards, and many are already getting nervous about it, including employers, and therefore uh, this one of course does not remove the Cadillac tax. Uh, it also frees exchanges from costly federal regulation and uh, combats hospital monopoly. It also migrates most Medicare enrollees and future uh, retirees onto these reform exchanges.
exchange. So there's some figures here about the deficit uh, of 30 year deficit reduction of 8 trillion and the 30 year revenue reduction of 2.5 trillion is what is estimated by this plan and it makes the Medicare trust permanently solvent and reduces private sector premium. So these are some of the um, uh, you know, uh, benefits from this plan. Uh, it also says for the Medicaid population, it improves provider access by 98% and medical productivity by 159%, obviously desirable things. And by 2025, it increases coverage by 12 point million above what is estimated by the Affordable Care Act. So this is just one proposed model and uh, just uh, so that you, you, you get a taste of what uh, it is. Okay, and I think at this point, I'll hand over to uh, our host, Greg Wallstrom. Yes, um, wow, thank you, Dr. Matthews, for uh, sharing a wealth of knowledge, especially with population health and healthcare reform. Um, before we pass the floor over to our final presenter this afternoon, I'd like to interject a couple quick questions. Uh, Dr. Matthews, as you mentioned about consumer socioeconomic status and the inability to pay for medical care in relation to the Affordable Care Act, do you think healthcare reform has positioned patients with less access to affordable health care? Well, that is an interesting question because I'm sure you have uh, two sides to that debate, but I think as the uh, years have gone beyond 2010 into 2015, we are definitely seeing, as I mentioned in that initial circle, that some are going to be dropping off rather than getting on. And therefore, I think, in a sense, over time, although initially, of course, we had whatever number uh, million uh, registered uh, through the insurance exchanges, I think over time, we're going to find, because private health insurance particularly is going to go up, it's already going up, where the employers are passing on much of the increase back to the uh, employees or the consumers, uh, we're definitely going to find more people dropping off. And that's why I said initially that that cycle seems to be reinforced, uh, even with 10 years of uh, the Affordable Care Act. So my answer really would be, I think we're going to be giving less access finally in terms of um, in the long run. And there's another aspect to it, and that is that uh, the accessibility of physicians who are still not adequate in the primary uh, rural areas, you find is going to therefore get even less. So if you take that factor in, physician access is actually going to be less because we're not churning out medical doctors as much as would be required for this increased volume of 18 or 20 or even 30 million uh, uh, coming into the insurance exchanges. So uh, my answer would be really no, I think we're actually uh, ultimately going to provide less access. Okay, okay. Um, um, I, I concur. I do believe, though, that the implementation of the Affordable Care Act has, has really caused many of the un uninsured and underinsured Americans to attain access, um, which inevitably um, will demonstrate a healthier impact on population health. So thanks for sharing that. Um, in respect to public health, um, could you tell us how how can you how can quality measures be improved um, from its current state in respect to public health? Well, I guess that's a, that's a broad question, but you know, uh, we have uh, both my co-speakers are public health experts. I'm going to ask them to chip in if they need to, but I'm just going to make it very simple uh, to say that I think there's got to be more awareness and education built in and about the you know many of the plans as they started out even before the ACA. Quality was a very clear focus in some organizations, and what they did not do at that time was bringing in the cost factors. So you talk of public health measures again, there were many initiatives, but the cost factors were never factored in together with that. So I think the ACA has forced us now to combine the cost with the, uh, the sorry, the quality and the cost to be considered at the same time. And I think that awareness and building that into our uh, system, uh, systems, uh, even in public health, would be a fundamentally in, uh, important thing. And of course, the other thing is uh, quality measures. When you say measures, uh, there are a lot of things that are done that are not measurable. And if they're not measurable, it didn't happen. So I think that's the other thing that in uh, in the public health arena, which I'd like uh, Sean or Dr. Madeep to comment, comment on also, uh, is uh, something that has been clearly defined and everybody kind of having similar measurable outcomes rather than different ones uh, would definitely help in uh, improving the current state. Absolutely. Sure, Dr. Mandeep or uh, Sean, would you guys like to chime in on that? Dr. Matthews, that standardization of data is a very critical component of population health management. I'd like to introduce our final panelists for today's discussion, and then we'll follow up with some questions from the audience. Um, good afternoon, Sean, and I'll pass the floor over to you. Thank you, Greg. Um, 
Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming today. I, um, my colleagues have um, hit very broad uh, topics, and so I've decided to focus on what we're doing here in Iowa. Um, so we have a very, I think, a unique situation here in Iowa. We have 101 public health departments, and we have 99 counties. So we have uh, one district and one um, local or city-based uh, health, public health department, but we have 99 county public health departments. 70% uh, of our county public health departments are uh, treating the growing aging population. I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but Iowa is ranked number four per capita in the number of individuals over the age of 65 and number one for those over the age of 80. And so um, we are uh, focused on addressing those top 5%, those the health issues of those who are the most costly, often coming with the increased aging population. Uh, one of the things that we've tried to focus on here is getting the community health needs assessment cycles um, together uh, between the nonprofit hospitals, which are now every three years, and the public health departments, which are in Iowa required every five years. Um, data collection should be ongoing, um, and the community health needs assessment is a reflection of that ongoing data collection. Uh, there are many, many sources, and in Iowa, there are some top ones that people use, and then our, our state um, public health department at the state level has a public health tracking portal. We also utilize the county health rankings and roadmaps assistance and support uh, quite frequently because you can take a lot of the data sources that are already calibrated, although there is a data lag, um, but you can use that uh, or at least those sources in your ongoing quality improvement efforts. And when you do that, there are many, many programs, evidence-based programs that can address whatever your top three health issues are that you determine in your assessment that you want to focus on uh, for your population. The biggest issue, however, is collaboration. Who should have a seat at the table? And more collaboration is needed. Uh, Leslie talked about uh, the business impact uh, with productivity losses and so on, and collaboration with business. And I completely agree that more collaboration is needed with business. They, you know, unfortunately, part of population health management now goes into the area of sales and <laughs> making the case to your business partners and your community, those stakeholders, for um, the impact on their business, the positive impact by assisting public health and the local hospital system in managing the health of their employees. Um, and then, of course, collaborating with social service nonprofits. They're used to doing more with less because that's what they have to do, much like public health, quite frankly. And so if the hospital systems are partnering with business, public health is partnering with business and the hospital system, you should be able to uh, overcome some of the cost issues and improve the public health, then producing more economic productivity. Uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a domino effect in an ideal world if everyone were talking. The problem is that we're all focused on our, often the problem is that we're all focused on our own measures, so our profit margins and so on, um, and at least in the hospital level. And so that's where I think it's hard to um, collaborate and increase the opportunities for those who should have a seat at the table. So on that note, I'd like to go ahead and ask a poll question. Um, of those in, on the call, um, does your healthcare organization or public health department work with uh, the local public health department, or if you're a local public health, do you work with your healthcare organization in the area? Wait just a couple more seconds. Looks like we have about 20 people, 16 people that haven't voted. But the majority of you look like you are working with local public health to some extent, and um, which is good. Which is good. Now, um, you know, the next evolution of that question would be great. You're working with local public health. 
Now, how many of you are collaborating with social service nonprofits and churches and businesses uh, and other organizations in the community to implement your health improvement plans? Uh, so I want to reference um, at a practical level a recent article in Healthcare Informatics from July 2015. So this month, uh, it was released about two weeks ago. And it's referencing a pioneer ACO um, in Webster County, Iowa with Unity Point Health and uh, Webster County Public Health. They actually, their ACO, Pioneer ACO covers eight counties. And so if there's collaboration among those eight county public health departments as well. Um, and some of the unique fe features of their tri-navigation um, that addresses care coordination uh, and increases connectivity between their providers, particularly primary care, mental health, public health. Uh, the key feature of their tribe navigation approach is constantly communicating between the three groups. Uh, they use uh, electronic health records uh, through EPIC uh, that's integrated, uh, and they're continuing to work on this. They have some issues at the public health with some of the public health departments. Um, getting uh, an interface, and they're actually working on that so they know exactly what the issue is. Uh, in the meantime, they have workarounds uh, to increase the uh, discharge planning and care coordination, so from paper copies of uh, prescriptions and discharge orders, follow-up visits, and so on with the patients that the patients can carry to their next provider. They're also doing a lot of phone calling. They use care navigators and health coaches. Uh, their next step is to um, continue to build on this by utilizing the data produced from the interconnectivity of these three components, primary care, mental health, and public health, um, to address their 5% uh, with the data analytics. And, of course, like I said, utilizing the county health rankings and roadmaps um, to integrate with the data they find at their local level as compared to the national level, and look at programs that they can use. Um, Carrie Prescott is the public health administrator in Webster County, and she does a great job interfacing with Unity Point um, COO over their Pioneer ACO. So I put on this slide that you can see here that you know we've talked about care coordination at an at a, excuse me at an application level here in Iowa, um, and what an ideal world is that. If you have all that information, you reduce those medication errors, reduce unneeded visits, and you increase the quality of care uh, by having all the providers talking. You're also addressing other components of a person's health by addressing the mental health and the public health component, not just their primary care needs. So one model that Mandeep referred to was Boost. And I'm a big fan of Boost uh, in particular because it helps address um, a lot of the readmission issues for the aging population. And here in Iowa, of course, like I referenced, that's very important. Um, AHRQ's big three are discharge planning, medication reconciliation, and care coordination. And Boost goes a step further by incorporating patient and family uh, education information through the Teach Back method. Uh, this ideal <laughs> program, if it works and all the components are running the way they should, then you start the moment the person is admitted with their discharge planning. And the, a component of that is care coordination. Um, the medication reconciliation, all of these are based on good communication uh, at all levels with the patient, the family understanding what's expected of them, but also their admitting physician, their public health department, because in Iowa, you may be admitted for um, congestive heart failure, say, or a cabbage, and you have um, been at the local hospital or the large hospital system, and then you go home three or four counties away to your little teeny county population, you know, 6,000, and your local public health department is the one preventing you from bouncing back. They're caring for your wound management. They're coming in and doing medication reconciliation. They're providing public health nursing, uh, the home and community-based services, and the skilled nursing services. Uh, they're checking your meds. Uh, they're managing your diabetes, whatever your comorbidities are. And so they're 
an integral part in reducing the cost of readmission and chronic care management. So those care navigators that they're using in uh, Webster County and those eight counties covered by the Pioneer ACO, um, they're doing those 24-hour and 72-hour follow-up calls. In Dallas County, Iowa, which is one of those counties um, neighboring um, Polk County, Des Moines, which is one of our largest metropolitan areas, our capital of our state. So a patient may be admitted to the large hospital there, Mercy or other, uh, and they go home to Dallas County. Well, Dallas County Public Health has a grant that they're using to help patients uh, fill their medication. Their public health director, Shelley Horak, was smart, and she made sure that she wrote that grant so that they would pick their meds up at the local high V pharmacy, which is our grocery store, or the Walmart pharmacy that has a grocery store. And so if they have funding to transport these patients there to receive their medications, then they're also able to make sure they have groceries because that's one of those social determinants of health access to um, food, healthy foods even, uh, that goes a step beyond just making sure their medication's been filled their prescriptions rather. And so that's why I'm a fan of Boost and a lot of the public health innovation. Um, public health is forced to think outside of the box and do more with less. And so partnering with them if you're a healthcare system is a smart financial move. Um, so in how does your organization use advanced analytics to drive population health management initiatives? How do you identify your 5%, the 5% of the population that accounts for 50% of the health care costs. Uh, so data analytics can support your care teams, your health coaches, your care navigators, so that your primary care physicians can spend more time treating the patient and less time entering all this data. This should be running in the background. This should be something that um, your care team looks at on an ongoing basis and not just once every three or five years, depending on what the requirement is. Okay. I was able to take away some good information um, that you shared with us, um, Sean, so thanks for sharing. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple quick questions before we open up the floor to the audience for question. Um, the first question is, is, when we examine the nine areas of quality, for example, population-centered, equitable, proactive, health-promoting, risk-reducing, vigilant, transparent, and effective and efficient. Do you think it's possible to reach all of these aims? Well, I'd rather focus on the possibility of trying to reach all of the aims. <laughs> um, you know, and like I said, this is through collaboration between these stakeholders in the community when they're both assessing the health issues and developing the plan to address the issues. Once they've completed that step, the process is ongoing in their assessment, impl implementation, and evaluation. Um, and so, I don't, I'm sure in an ideal world, you would think it's possible, but there's so many unknowns. Um, every community is different. We, we have a thing we say in Iowa, if you've been in one public health department, you've been in one public health department. And the, um, that's why each county does a community health needs assessment, because based on the industry, the agriculture, other influences in the area, those social determinants of health influence each community differently. Um, so those variables you can't control for. So it's what you control for is your process. So being proactive, partnering with business, selling the benefits of having people reduce the number of lost days at work and improving their health, reducing their health care costs, particularly if they're a self-insured employer. All those things um, are ongoing and all contribute ultimately little by little to the improvement of the population's health. Thank you, Sean. Um, I think it's essential to strategically examine all of the nine areas and find out, you know, where you could uh, use some enhancements and start to create a plan to move away from the norm. Um, one question before we open up the discussion um, for the attendees: um, as a healthcare uh, as a senior healthcare executive, uh, would you consider what would you consider to be the primary drivers of population health quality and outcome? A primary driver of the population health. Uh, I mean, obviously, the quality and the outcomes all are affected by how well all the influences. So all the participants, whether if you're talking about the tri-navigation approach, that so you have primary care, mental health, public health, 
but also how well they communicate with each other. I mean, it's communication that's at the foundation of care coordination and discharge planning. And if you are able to communicate in this advanced age um, of technology through uh, an electronic healthcare platform, so say like the Epic Health, Electronic Health Records or some other um, platform, or just being vigilant in making phone calls and following up and following through, it takes time and takes a lot of effort and manpower often, um, but I think the biggest driver is communication and collaboration. When healthcare leaders explore provider patient attributions by keeping a keen precision defining population health management, can you and uh, Dr. Matthew explain how the transition from historical methods changed related to ACOs and patient centered medical homes? And I can address that here in Iowa. One of the things that we um, have been working on is creating um, a greater awareness of the impact of an interconnectivity of public health on the uh, ACO's quality measures on patient care. And um, like I had referenced before, it's the small, in Iowa, it's the small public health departments that are caring for these patients after discharge or with ongoing chronic illness, say diabetes or cardiac care. And so uh, just creating a common language and a common platform for understanding of those impacts um, and then measuring the data and understanding the cost benefits uh, related to that. I mean, those are what we're working on in this transition. Um, Sean, thanks for that. I just wanted to add, and I think one of my slides had it, we didn't talk about patient provider attribution. So for the, those of you, you know, just for an understanding, that's one of the most complicated aspects of population health management uh, and accountable care. Determining who is really responsible for the patient. So who really actually constitutes the patient's care team? What is their relative involvement in the patient's care? There are a number of different ways to identify the patient relationship of each care team member. Sometimes the patient will explicitly select a physician. A relationship established primarily through the insurance company. However, this formal assignment doesn't always represent the reality of accountability. Even though one doctor is the assigned primary care provider, the PCP, the patient might actually visit another doctor more frequently, a specialist for instance. So a common method for appropriately attributing clinical patient relationship is developing algorithms that can analyze the patient's visit patterns. This kind of sophisticated attribution work will become even more essential and challenging when assigning financial risk and performance incentives back to the physicians that are accountable for the care. I just wanted to comment on that. That's something that we have to be cognizant of. And just as a reminder, if you have a, a question, please type your question into the text box on the left-hand side of the screen. If you have a specific question for one of the presenters, please put his or her name next to your question. As we look at the questions at, uh, coming across the screen, um, I do have one question. Um, how has electronic health record EHR or ER, EMR impacted population health? So, Greg, I'll, I'll go with that question. So EHRs were not originally designed for population health management. They were supposed to help physicians document better and reduce record keeping costs. EHRs did have some limited safety and quality features such as drug interaction checkers and health maintenance alerts. And the lack of interoperability among disparate EHRs has made it difficult for providers to exchange information with each other. The key goal of new delivery models, ACO, CCMH, as well as meaningful use stage two, is to improve exchange of patient information between providers who have those disparate EHR systems. Health maintenance alerts in EHRs can meet the criteria to improve preventive and chronic care for population health management, but they fall short of what's needed. Um, these alerts often can't be customized and are usually not linked to automated messaging or PHM dashboards. The healthcare organizations, they need to build this infrastructure for value-based reimbursement. So the basic ingredients for population health management, including patient access to records within 24 hours and stage three of a meaningful use proposal, patient-generated health data using health risk assessments, automated patient-specific education, which is sent to patients, secure electronic messaging and tracking patient responses. So all these things, all, all
all these components, they need to be in place for us to really have a true infrastructure for population health management. And then one more question coming from the audience is, how does the push away from fee-for-service to fee-for-value impact population health programs? Quickly, my comment on that would be that it really involves a paradigm shift, particularly for the hospital system. Um, every executive, every care, you know, clinic manager, this is one of their ways of thinking is that basic fee-for-service model. And to change their paradigm, it's very easy for public health to think that way because we're measuring value, we're measuring quality, we're measuring outcomes um, because the funding we receive is generally sweat, set. And so we have to do more with less, uh, as often as many social service nonprofits in the community have to do as well. Um, and so the push away from fee-for-service to fee-for-value will positively impact population health programs. The, problem comes in straddling two systems and being brave enough and financially secure enough to take the leap uh, or invest in taking the leap. Because over time, we know it will save money and it will improve health, which saves money. But it, it really takes bravery to jump from one to the other and an understanding of where you're going, a vision for where you will be so that you can survive that rocky path in the transition. Dr. Mandeep, did you have any thoughts or opinions? Sure. So I would just reiterate what Sean said and add a comment, which is that healthcare leaders, we as healthcare leaders, we support moving away from fee-for-service payment because Medicare plans to shift 50% of its payments to such programs as value-based programs by 2018. But what we are really talking about is blending fee-for-service with payment approaches encompassing larger units of patient care. And I'll give you an example of a bundled payment. So, for example, a bundled payment for hip replacement would cover all hospital care as well as services provided by multiple physicians um, or rehabilitation and post-acute care facilities and possibly prescription drugs. So currently, the approach for bundled payment is built on existing fee-for-service payment and includes quality standards. So a target is established for an episode of care, and if fee-for-service amount is lower or higher than this target, the providers share in savings and losses with the payer. And it's the same for accountable care organizations as well. Uh, you know, in terms of accountable care organizations, um, they include all of a patient's care over year, and that can be built on a fee-for-service foundation. At the end of the year, payers and providers share any savings or losses, giving providers incentive to care about both the quality and efficiency of care. We certainly do need oversight so the providers don't spend on needed care, uh, but many organizations accepting bundled or capitated payments still pay positions on basis of productivity or volume with this bedrock of fee-for-service. And so I will, I will just... And by saying that fee-for-service will probably always be an element of provider payment, but with a diminished role, more suitable for a system committed to both quality and efficiency. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mandeep. We would like to especially thank uh, Greg Wallstrom, Dr. Mandeep Mangat, Dr. Leslie Matthew, and Sean Zerke for taking the time to share pertinent information about population health management and the impact that it has on our healthcare organizations and communities. The healthcare executive will be holding another webinar on law, mediation in our healthcare organizations, and 304B prescription drug pricing program, and cybersecurity and modern health. Uh, please stay tuned um, for future dates on those programs. This is the Healthcare Executive social media page, and we would like you to connect with us across these uh, social networks. Um, you can also read contact information. And we would like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us this afternoon. This concludes today's webinar.